very much. Okay. I'll work too. Yeah, we'll just wait a second for running. the draft of <coughs> our joint paper with Aurelia and Carl, which is in some ways an attempt to pull what we feel are some of the key insights, both of some of what you heard today, of a number of um, other papers also, and more generally to try and reflect on South Africa's political settlement or social order. I'll say a few words about this now, uh, depending on whether we use North Wallace and Wine Gas framework or Mushtaq Khan's. Um, and really to, to think about where, where South Africa is heading and to try and make sense, first and foremost, of, of some of its, uh, I suppose, a big question of today, developmental impasse or uh, neoliberal success. As Marx once famously remarked, the only thing which is worse for a worker than to be exploited is not to be exploited. But also very high levels of precarious employment. For their survival, the poor depend on usually very low wages or transfers very often from these wages, as well as to a certain extent from transfers from the state. Then when they need to spend these wages and buy basic necessities, they face prices set by powerful companies, whether in milling, dairy, banking, which have succeeded in extracting yet more surplus from them at this end, as shown by a string of competition commission cases, some of which have been discussed today. Moreover, the provision of basic services, whether education, transport or health, is costly and in many cases of very poor quality. To give you one example which I think is particularly striking, South Africa is one of the very few countries in the world where recently maternal mortality rates, at birth rate, have actually been increasing. Now, this set of issues sets a remarkably, sheds a remarkably reactionary light on what Alan Hirsch called the ANC's, and I'm quoting here, firmly entrenched fear of the risks of personal dependency on the state and of the emergence of entitlement attitudes amongst the poor. End of quote. The ANC shares these kinds of bourgeois preoccupations and many more with a lot of its peers in the neoliberal new left, whether in Britain or in Chile. This desire to discipline the poor, which is discussed in Firoz Khan's paper in the special issue which you got, is visible in rejections, for example, of all ideas of a universal income grant, uh, in favor of increasing the expanded public works program. The idea here is that you're going to give the poor small money for work instead of giving them small money for nothing. Now, this is in spite of towering evidence of poor working conditions, mismanagement, and very poor levels of training associated with these public works programs. Poor workers who face usually very harsh working conditions, low pay and growing casualization are also blamed by the state, business and the media for being underskilled, overprotected and often overpaid. Proposals to make the labor market even more flexible are ultimately designed to discipline the poor again. But what is very ironic is that such a culture of entitlement has nonetheless emerged as a result of the form of the economic transition from apartheid. But entitlement here is hardly an attitude that the poor have. In South Africa, it is the rich, whether the new BE elite or the incumbent minerals energy complex and finance one, who have behaved in a way which would only despair development economists eager to see processes of learning, upgrading, and economic diversification. Banks, for example, in this country are content with investing on derivative markets and supporting consumption of the most useless kind often, but their portfolio in manufacturing and agriculture is incredibly thin. Now this is not about a value judgment on elites, nor does it entail a deterministic view of development. Human agency, either by capitalist workers or the state, or movements cutting through these, has an important role to play. As Mushtaq Khan notes in his paper on political settlements, some political settlements are associated uh, with rapid growth and development and others are not. One thing that characterizes all political settlements in developing countries, and I would add to this probably in developed countries too, is that they are corrupt. And this is actually Mushtaq Khan, and I think North Wales and Wine Gas share this view, not really where the point is. Those who are associated with rapid development entail a rent-seeking system which has at its heart the promotion of learning and productivity growth. Class relation, race and government, uh, the shape of government and its interventions, are all part of this picture. 
in a way which is more complex than I think we can do full justice to uh, even throughout today. But we're going to try to do this. The point we want to make here, and I suppose the key point about our analysis of the South African political settlement, is not that South African capitalists are intrinsically all lazy, but that the kind of political settlement which has emerged in South Africa has produced, which South Africa has produced, sorry, seems to be thoroughly unable to discipline capital in a developmental way. Wherever productive capitalists do exist, they are usually left without support. But should a beet entrepreneur want to import toys made in China rather than manufacture them locally, or a foreign arms company promise billions of industrial investment in exchange for a few helicopters, or were they frigates, and never invest a cent in spite of its promises, then absolutely no problem. Neither of these two constituencies, international capital and new black capitalists, have however been treated with as much respect as large incumbent white capital. Think of it in two ways, through two examples. One is that the continuation of policies of capital account liberalization into the post-94 period, and the perhaps surprising permission given to Anglo-American and other conglomerates to list outside South Africa, have led a number of South African companies to attract, extract huge amounts of dividends every year out of the national economy. One of the main causes of the country's current account deficit, resulting in a huge investment shortfall, as well as important systemic vulnerability. The second point is, South Africa has two companies, Sassel and ArcelorMittal, which produce very efficiently and quite cheaply because of the cheap inputs they have access to, the two single most important inputs into manufacturing, polymers, the plastics, and steel. And yet, in spite of repeated promises and a variety of policy discussions, the government has completely failed to get the prices of these basic industrial inputs down to support manufacturing development. A few years ago, the late development economist Alice Amzin was in South Africa for a, a program, a training program, and she told a leading South African minister, what are you doing to bring your mining companies in line and get cheap inputs for your industry? If you don't crack the whip, no one else will. And in, unfortunately, no one has. And this is the core of really what we want to try and explore today and what we've tried already to look at. Why so much talk about disciplining the poor when the problem in South Africa is that the rich are having their cake and eating it without sharing it much. Now first, we'd like to discuss the South African conundrum as seen through the prism of North Wallace and Wainga's social orders framework. Namely, why such a good example of what they would call a mature limited access order with strong institutions, a relatively smooth transition and apparently solid elite agreements has dismally failed at producing growth and development. Secondly, we will attempt to answer this by showing that South Africa is a case, amongst many others, of neoliberal deepening. Much more than a national democratic revolution, South Africa has experienced a national neoliberal revolution. This will be shown by pointing to some of the sometimes unsettling continuities between the pre and post-94 period, but also by drawing more on Khan's political settlement framework. Thirdly, we will discuss the increasing fragility of South Africa's social order or political settlement, um, and why what has hitherto been a stable dominant coalition is finding itself increasingly under threat. And we will conclude on the relative value of the two models, but also try to point to some directions for change. Now, drawing on North Wales and Wangas, in many respects, South Africa can be considered to be, in their typology, what they call a mature limited access order. So they basically have this topology as limited access order basically encompasses all developing countries, really. Um, and open access orders characterize the so-called developed countries. And there's three categories of limited access orders, and the, let's say the most advanced one is, is the one that is called mature, the one that is most likely, in other words, to emerge or to become developed. Now, just to read you a few of the characteristics uh, of what is in, in the table in, in, the, in the book, um, In the Shadow of Violence, the characteristics of mature access order societies have, in terms of economic organizations, many private firms, some multinationals, effectively limited entry requiring political connections. That's why. This is consistent with previous work by Dr. Snow, but also by Nicola Hazel, who's here today, who point to the superior efficiency of impersonal rules when it comes to promoting economic growth. The short version of this is personally based allocation of economic privileges is less likely to be efficient than rule-based <coughs> allocation. Now, according to 
MWW's framework, I don't know how many W there should be in now, because there's a new W for the whole thing. South Africa post-1994 should have done very well economically, as it was definitely moving in the right direction, at least until 2008. Firstly, democratic institutions. These allowed to maintain the social order thanks to very important symbolic political gains, socioeconomic rights and protections, um, were, sorry, socioeconomic rights uh, were given to the black population, but there were also important concessions to the white population. Uh, of course, the defense of private property, the sunset clauses, and I think prime amongst them, the guarantee of state pensions, which is extensively discussed by Fred Harris in a paper a few years ago. Secondly, the restructuring of the dominant elite coalition started with the identification by leading capitalists in the division of Afrikaners in the 1980s of the ANC as the best political force to ensure the possibility of a continuous transition. And therefore what happened was an economic incorporation of a number of people related to the ANC into the dominant business coalition, with of course someone like Cyril Ramaphosa being a prime example, because his incorporation uh, basically prevented a very major conflict within the ANC in the early 1990s. Um, then there's also the facilitating stability of the economic structure. I mean, the metamorphosis energy complex, as my colleague Susan Sam and Ben have shown, uh, has become increasingly financialized, which has allowed it to remain the dominant economic force in the country, but also through financialization, to facilitate the incorporation of selected new black capitalists into the activities of mining and finance. Thirdly, the macroeconomic framework, which we discussed earlier, was stabilized in favor of orthodox policies, which are Remember, considered to be <coughs> policies by most neoclassical economists. Uh, the continuation of liberalization, privatization, and the commercialization of SOEs, uh, which again here clearly reflects a uh, convergence of views between the ANC and big business. Finally, the state was used for middle class creation and broadly nurturing client relations from catered developments like economic compound deals, but also more broadly the creation of large, uh, a large number of civil service positions. Uh, and uh, the increasing uh, <coughs> grant system, which of course the grant system itself is carried forward and initiated in the 1980s. In other words, South Africa could contradict the statement by North Wales, Point, Gas, and Webb that since, and I quote here, limited access order societies are all organized to prevent violence, this often hinders traditional reform efforts. Indeed, continuity in key good policies and institutional building were accompanied by a finally peaceful transition, of course, a very violent phase. Excellent protection of property rights as measured by global indicators of corporate governance. The side note when we interviewed our paper, uh, somebody from Maryland, Bank of America, the first thing we did when we came to the group in Cape Town was to show us, I think I forget what they're called, the documents they use in Davos, to show us that South Africa's ranking in terms of corporate governance, which really means the protection of property rights and large scale capitalists, that's what corporate governance is about, uh, was one of the top in the world ahead of a lot of developers. Uh, and of course, a sharp decline in violence, in particular after 1995, uh, shown by Carl, uh, were all signs of, in many ways, a very healthy access uh, order society, limited access order. <coughs> in spite of all of these favorable conditions, South Africa is far from having become an open access order, or indeed from being on the path to being a developed country. In fact, it looks in many ways that it is going backwards in many of the dimensions that I have mentioned. Growth has been sluggish and unsustainable. And the country has not emerged from a typical middle income trend. This is in particular visible through deindustrialization, which has started in the 1980s and continued unabated since then, proving therefore to be premature, here, according to the work of Fowler and Trigena, making the economy unable to incorporate through decent jobs or other economic opportunities much of the hitherto and as a result still impoverished black population. South Africa has combined extremely high employment, hovering around 35% with even higher rates of casual or informal employment, even when measured within formerly recorded employment. About 60% of recorded formal employment is casual or informal, according to Derek Hughes' calculations for 2008 and 2009. The key contradiction is that if for no words in wine gas, institutions represent the rules of the game which determine the degree of political and economic openness, then South Africa represents an extreme paradoxical case of very strong open access institutions with very close actual access in practice. This points in our view to a crucial dimension, or sorry, a crucial limitation in the work of Douglas North. Namely, the enduring assumption that good institutions and policies 
are necessarily those of late 20th century Anglo-Saxon capitalist countries. If anything, the South African trajectory confirms that these institutions are very good at consolidating dominant interests, but not at challenging them. So the key to understanding South Africa's developmental impasse, in our view, is to turn the analysis around. The promises of development associated with the prescriptions of the Washington and post-Washington consensus were never going to result in sustained growth. In fact, they never did anyway. Instead, they facilitated the deepening of neoliberalism in South Africa, with similar characteristics to what happened in other countries. Indeed, analyzing Chile's post pinochet transition, Gabriel Papa identified a conundrum which in our view equally well capture the political economy of post apartheid South Africa, and allow me to put it later. The basic political dilemma for any oligarchy determined to hold on to such degrees of inequality, or even to increase it, is how to construct a winning strategy that is sustainable when in a democracy. Given the fact that the oligarchy forms such a tiny minority and that the distributional outcome that it seeks is so remarkably unequal. Strategy 3 